Good evening. Each year in the festival, we feature an appropriate lecture in honour of the late Dr. John Cumming, a man who believed in service to others and particularly in encouraging young people who have challenges to face. Sadly, in the past 12 months, his wife Anne has passed away. And so this year, we commemorate them together with a choice of subject that we believe they both would have appreciated. For John, it's the story of a man who came through many challenges to succeed brilliantly. And for Anne, who was an artist, it's a story of great art. It's the account of a man born in Kirkwall 300 years ago, who came through unsettled Jacobite times to become one of the greatest engravers of his age. His name was Robert Strang, later to become Sir Robert Strange. Patricia Long, who has traced so many famous Orkney connections worldwide and described them on her About Orkney website and elsewhere, is here to tell us about the life of the great engraver. Thank you, Harry. This year's talk is a strange one about a Jacobite knighted by George III, who was one of the most successful Arcadian artists that is almost unknown in Orkney today. Sir Robert Strange began life as Robbie Strang. He was born in July 1721 in what's now Victoria Street in Kirkwall. His father, David, was the borough treasurer, and through his mother, Jean Scully, he was the first cousin of Robert Lane, later provost of Kirkwall and father of Malcolm and Samuel. So the family was well connected. Robbie attended Kirkwall Grammar School until he was 14, where he was taught by Mud Mackenzie, now famous as a map maker. Like so many Arcadian boys, Robbie wanted to go to sea, but he followed his widowed mother's wishes and went to work in the office of Murdoch's lawyer brother James. It was not a busy office, so Robbie passed his spare time in drawing and was pleased enough with his efforts to take some of them with him when he moved on. Perhaps because it was quickly apparent that he was unhappy in his new life, before long his mother sent him to stay with his older half-brother, James Strang, who was a lawyer in Edinburgh. Robbie later described him as being like a second father to him. The first thing James did was to allow his young brother to find out if a life at sea was really what he wanted, by arranging for him to join the crew of a man of war, the Albera, on a voyage around England and across to Sweden. <clears throat> a few months on the North Sea in bad weather was enough to show Robbie that the sailor's life was not for him. So he settled down quite willingly in his brother's office. Presumably, life in 18th century Edinburgh was more interesting than Kirkwall. There still wasn't enough work to keep Robbie fully occupied, so in his spare time, he had done to his drawing. When James came across the drawings when hunting through a drawer, he was impressed enough to show them to Richard Cooper. Cooper, though largely forgotten now, was an important figure in the Scottish Enlightenment. Engraving was an important skill for all sorts of print and material, such as notices and book illustrations, but was also the only access to art for all but the wealthy. Cooper was impressed enough by the drawings to offer to give Robbie Strang a six-week trial. Well before the six weeks were up, he was offered a six-year apprenticeship. So in 1735, still only about 14 or 15, he moved to Cooper's house in St John's Street in the Cannon Gate. Cooper was one of the founders of the Edinburgh School of St Luke in 1729, the first academy for artists in Scotland. Because of his work on illustrations for the surgeon Alexander Munro, he had good connections with the university and classes were held in a room at the university's old quad. Robert Strange, as he now called himself, attended the evening classes. This sketch of a life drawing class, the first in Scotland, is thought to have been drawn by Richard Cooper about 1737, so Robert may well be one of the artists in the picture. Living in Edinburgh in the 1740s, Robert may have developed Jacobite tendencies before he met Isabella Lumsden, but he might not have become so actively engaged in the cause if it hadn't been a condition of their betrothal in 1744. He became one of Bonnie Prince Charlie's lifeguards. Most of the information for this talk comes from a memoir written by James Denniston in 1855. 
He was married to Sir Robert's great grandniece, who had access to family papers, including some short autobiographical sketches. There is nothing about the 45 Rebellion until shortly before the Battle of Culloden. Robert Strange was summoned to the Prince's house in Inverness <clears throat> and asked if he could engrave plates to print banknotes to be issued to the soldiers. He thought this would be quite possible, but doubted that Inverness had the rolling press that would be needed. He returned the next day to say that there wasn't a press, <clears throat> but he had talked to an intelligent carpenter about building one. He found a coppersmith and made there a chin varnish. Within a fortnight, he was ready to begin to print, when news came of the approach of the Duke of Cumberland. So no banknotes were officially printed for almost 200 years. The plate was found near a ford over the River Spain in 1835 and was in private hands until bought by the West Highland Museum in Fort William in 1928. And they kindly provided this image. 52 prints were made back then <clears throat> and sold for 10 and 6 each to raise funds for the museum. Coincidentally, the plate has been used to raise funds again this year. According to the museum website, the frame for this first print is made of beech from the avenue at Achnacari that was being planted by Cameron of Lochil when he heard that Bonnie Prince Charlie had raised his standard at Glenfinnan and hurried away to join him. The framed print was auctioned by Lyne and Turnbull last month and raised £6,250. The raffle for an unframed print closes in two days' time, 12 noon on 7th September. Head to the museum website if you'd like to spend £10 on a ticket. Robert Strange mentioned a thistle and a rose in the design. I can just about make out the thistle on the right. The central image is CP, standing for Carola's Princeps, surmounted by Prince of Wales feathers. Although near the heart of the action at Culloden, Strange's description of the battle doesn't include being involved in the fighting. He wrote, the scene of confusion was now great, nor can the imagination figure it. The men in general would be taking themselves precipitately to flight. Nor were there any possibility of their being rallied. Horror and dismay were painted in every countenance. It now became time to provide for the prince's safety. His person had been abundantly exposed. The greater numbers of the army were already out of danger, the flight having been so precipitate. We got upon a rising ground, where we turned round and made a general halt. The scene was indeed tremendous. Never was so total a rout, a more thorough discomfiture of an army. The adjacent country was in a manner covered with its ruins. The whole was over in about 25 minutes. The great pursuit was upon the road towards Inverness. Of towards 6,000 men, which the Prince's army at this period consisted of, about 1,000 were asleep in Culloden parks, who knew nothing of the action until awakened by the noise of the cannon. These in general endeavoured to save themselves by taking the road towards Inverness, and most of them fell a sacrifice to the victors, for this road was in general strewed with dead bodies. The prince at this moment had his cheeks bedewed with tears, what must not his feeling heart have suffered. Robert's description ends here, but a story passed down in the family claims that when Hanoverian soldiers searched a house in Inverness, they found Isabella Lumsden sitting, singing to herself while sewing and didn't discover that her fiancé was hiding under her crinoline. Robert Strange found his way to Edinburgh. He was fortunate not to be one of those listed as sought by the Cumberland's army, but as a known Jacobite, he did need to lie low. And for some months, but some months, kept body and soul together with his skill as an artist and engraver. He's described as painting miniatures of the Jacobite leaders. And he is also credited with these fans, so it's not clear whether they'd been done before Culloden or afterwards. The bottom image is a photo taken by my son Matthew at the V&A in Dundee. The other two come from the websites of the British Museum and the West Highland Museum. There are online images and references to other fans in private hands. The museums agree that the Prince's companions in the central composition are the Roman god and goddess of war, Mars and Bellona. But the British Museum, the fan on the left, identifies Mars as Cameron of Lorille and Bellona as Flora MacDonald, implying they must have been made after uh, Culloden, 
there are other suggestions of a ball being held in Edinburgh. The Geoffrey Seddon gave a talk in 2010 at a conference on 400 years of Scottish glass making. And he taught about these, the Amen glasses. You can see lots of pictures of them online. They are the most famous early Scottish glasses. There are 37 of them. And they all have the Jacobite anthem ending with Amen engraved on them. They're recognised as all being engraved by the same hand over several years in the 1740s. Geoffrey said and put forward the view, which seems to have been accepted, that the evidence points to Robert Strange as their creator. One glass, known as the Lennox Love Glass, was sold in 2012 for £43,000. Robert and Isabella married in London in 1747, and the following year he went to France. This was to study art, rather than being anything to do with his Jacobite sympathies. Though he and Isabella were in regular correspondence with her brother Andrew, who was the prince's private secretary in Paris. In September 1748, Robert went to Rouen to study miniature painting at the Academy of Art there. He was awarded the first prize in drawing nine months later, but realised that his real talent lay in engraving works of art. He went to Paris in July 1749 to study at the training workshop of Jacques-Philippe Labat, whose students include almost all of the great French engravers. Thanks, presumably largely to a six-year apprenticeship with Richard Cooper, Strange's skill at dry point etching developed quickly. These are his first two prints, exhibited in Paris in 1750. He said that people found it hard to believe that they were both by the same artist, but he had felt that different techniques were needed for Le Retour de Marché by the Flemish artist Philippe Svauermann and Cupid by the French artist Charles-André Van Loo. Prints sold for half a crown each. Strange came to London later that year, where he was joined by Isabella and their daughter Mary. His first commission was to superintend the illustrations for Scottish surgeon William Hunter's groundbreaking book on the anatomy of pregnant women, The Gravid Uterus. Strange engraved two of the plates himself, and one has been described as perhaps the most beautiful anatomical plate that has ever been given to the world. But I decided not to include it here, as it's fairly startling. It's easy to find online. Robert Strange was a great admirer of classic Italian painting, and this is what he based his career on. He is credited with playing a large part in introducing continental art to Britain. His ambition was to travel to Italy to make copies of the great artists, and he finally set off in 1760, armed with letters of introduction. Oh, <clears throat> Horace Walpole wrote to Horace Mann, <clears throat> the British envoy in Florence, he's a very first-rate artist and by far our best. Pray countenance him, though, though you will not approve of his politics. He spent four years in Florence, Naples, Parma, Bologna and Rome, drawing works by Titian, Raphael, Reggio and others. His work was so well regarded that scaffolding was erected for his use in the Vatican, and his portrait was included in a series of eminent engravers on the print room in the Vatican Library. He was elected a member of the academies of Rome, Florence and Parma. One of his finest engravings, was done in Parma in 1763. This is the Madonna and Child of St Jerome and Mary Magdalene by Correggio, and was chosen by Stanley Custer for his 1949 book on Scottish art. He wrote, Strange was certainly one of the finest engravers of the time. His work is marked by great delicacy of tone, combined with breadth and vigour, in a manner that has hardly been equalled. In a letter to Ernest Marwick in 1969, he remarked on his extraordinary gift in selecting the texture and character of his engraving to translate the quality of the pictures he produced. He was quite remarkable and very near the top of his profession. Only one or two Frenchmen were alone his superior. Ernest had just written an article on Robert Strange, which is included in John Robertson's second collection of his writing, published in 2012. Strange returned to London in 1765, but for various reasons found it harder to get recognition there. However, he pressed on. As well as his own prints, he organised exhibitions and sales of paintings and drawings that he imported from the continent. His descriptive catalogues dating from 1769 to 1775 include works by Canaletto, Rubens, Titian, Raphael and Bruegel. He gradually found favour with the royal family 
and in 1780 produced this engraving of the Van Dyck portrait of Charles I hunting with the Marquis of Hamilton. <coughs> Although I know very little about dry point engraving, I am fascinated by the skill and patience that must have been needed to give the impression of the different colours and textures. In 1787, George III granted permission for him to copy Benjamin West's portrait of two young princes who had died aged three and four a few years earlier, the apotheosis of Prince Alfred and Prince Octavius. He worked on this in the palace and the royal family sometimes came and watched. When he presented the prince in 1784, George III said, Mr. Strange, I have another favour to ask of you. It is the, that you will attend the levy on Wednesday or Friday, that I may confer on you the honour of knighthood. He promptly changed his mind and said, I'm going directly to St James's. If you'll follow me, I'll do it now. Sooner the better. He has also said to made a joking reference to Strange's Jacobite background by wondering if he had any objection to be knighted by the Elector of Hanover. Sir Robert died five years later, in July 1792. He had worked almost to the end, selecting the best prints from his 50 plates to be bound in a limited edition book. It's a copy in the Orkney Archive. He left behind a reputation as a great artist and a thoroughly decent man. It was said that it was impossible to know him and not be his friend. He also left a sizable estate, legacies of £10,800 as well as other property. <clears throat> Despite Robert and Isabella spending much of their lives in different countries, as Robert spent much of his career working in a Paris studio, they managed to have a large family and were survived by two daughters and three sons. Just time to mention two of their sons. There was a tiny island in Nootka Sound on the west side of Vancouver Island. Its name, Strange Island, must mystify anyone who notices it, because who would guess that it's got its name? from James Charles Stuart Strange, godson of James III, the old pretender, and one of the very first fur traders on Canada's west coast. Robert and Isabella's second son went out to India in 1753 and had a successful career with the East India Company. Reading the account of Captain Cook's last voyage, James was inspired by the suggestion of the large profits to be made selling Canadian furs in China and convinced the company to spot an expedition of two ships from India to Vancouver. He turned out to be ill-suited to fur trading and made a large loss, but he prospered again with the company and died a wealthy man. Oddly, his brother Thomas also worked in Canada and India. He trained as a lawyer and was admitted to the bar in 1785. Only four years later, aged just 33, thanks to the influence of a family friend, Lord Macefield, he was appointed Chief Justice of Nova Scotia. He was very successful and was well liked and respected in the six years he was there. Surprisingly, Nova Scotia was a slave owning state, having a large population of loyalists who left the USA after the revolution. Thomas Strange didn't make any move to try to abolish slavery, but aimed to wear it out gradually by demanding such full proof of ownership in any case brought to him that the slave owner almost invariably lost. Thomas returned to England in 1796 and was knighted before setting off to India to become Chief Justice of Madras until 1816. He was the first British lawyer to study Hindu law and wrote influential books on the subject. <coughs> you can find James Deniston's memoir of Orkney's Forgotten Artist, as well as catalogues from his art exhibitions on their website archive, archive.org. The British Museum website has over 300 images of Sir Robert's engravings and sketches. Ernest Marwick quoted the 19th century Scottish historian John Hill Burton, who said, Strangers' engravings must have done much to create a better taste in his own country. Though he is seldom mentioned in contemporary literature, the Scots took him as a national artist and purchased his plates. This is attested at the present day by the frequency of the recurrence in the narrow black frames not only in the country houses of the gentry, but in the stores of brokers and petty booksellers. Although we can now enjoy more colourful art, I agree with Ernest that only those who can see no beauty in perfection of craftsmanship can fail to recognise the superb quality in the best of his engravings. I'm glad to have had the chance to mark the 300th anniversary of Sir Robert Strange. It's a fascinating story 
the adventures of an Orkney man who became a very active part of the times he lived in. Warm thanks, Patricia, for giving us a new insight into a remarkable man to remember in this 300th anniversary of his birth. Our thanks, too, to the technical team behind the scenes, to the viewers at home. And looking a little ahead, at eight o'clock this evening, we're going to move out into space. We're going to hear about a journey through the solar system of an interstellar visitor. That's later on. And in the meantime, we'll simply say thank you again and goodbye for now. Goodbye.